how does a luthier sell a cello to somebody in a different part of the world? How do you do that? Because that's I, I, I don't live here in Cremona, I live in France. It happens actually quite often, mm -hmm. more and more now because we have uh, certainly the technology. Uh, I even sold the cello. My apprentice are going home, huh? checking the word, okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> now with uh, all the, the technical uh, um, machinery, or I don't know how you call that, it's possible. So I even sold a cello via YouTube. Uh, people ask me what I have. Okay, stop for a moment. You sold a cello via YouTube? Yes. How, does, how do you sell it? People are going to want to know. How do you sell a cello via YouTube? They listen to all my channel and everything I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. They like the way I am, how I'm telling them how I make it. They want to know a little bit more about it. They want to know what I have ready and they want to listen to it. So then I have somebody who plays the cello and then in comparing one kind of instrument to another one, one model and another model, a Scala Perfetta, Linea Maki, my master, a master of Min, a master of Anna Arietti and so on, they even via the email or the WhatsApp or the Skype or whatever, every kind of messenger, everything, I like all kind of channels, they can listen to the differences and they compare what they have and because of that and the price certainly they decide and then they just trust and uh, say okay Edgar I'm going to pay for it and you send me the cello and in case they don't like it they send it back this is the best way so the box certainly a cello to send to a musician has to be set up with the bridge and the strings and everything then I turn it down a little bit and then I put it into a case and a lot of chips the box is pretty big but not very heavy and uh, probably most people who order a cello now in that case don't expect but even a violin is a, quite a big package because in case they drop it too hard it still will survive and it's some kind of a suspension in these chips and uh, they get instruction by email what they have to do when the, pack uh, the package is arriving take it out tune it double check certain things and uh, play it and or they love it or they send it back and it works and where did this person live that person was living in finland so we're in italy and that went much further than uh, toulouse because you sent one to me also and it arrived safe and it arrived you know the violin maker safe, um, for lo some of you out there or for all of you out there one of my students in my studio here in france uh, bought one of his cellos and you can too so he actually has a YouTube channel it will be linked in the description below he not only made my cello but he made, made one of the students cellos that loves by the way the cello very much and it's funny whenever I play a cello I'm always like because I had I had one of his his um, I want to say baseline cellos but is one of the most, I call it, the most accessible cellos. Entry line, but it's a, it's a very... But it's not I entry, think, uh, but it's not entry. For the money it, it costs, for, I think it is very, very good. And I'm totally honest because I've, you know, I've worked with Luthier in California and I've worked with Luthiers in France. The value that, that the, the, the Scala Perfetta, that's yeah, the one? Scala Perfetta. Uh, the value of that instrument is... Um, well, it's very well valued. Let me tell you, it's yeah. it could easily go for more in California. They and even more in on France. other parts in the world they even sell it more than double, even uh, yeah. three times as much. So it's even cheaper to go directly through you. I, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for any of you out there who are dreaming about a genuine, you know, Cremona Luthier from here, like that's Stradivarius right here. That's that's him. You can get in contact with him and try out one of his cellos. And the thing about an instrument is people want to try the instrument. How do you do that when a person is shopping for an instrument? And have you had many people like, eh, I don't like it and send it back? Or has it 
How often up has that today happened? Just curious. Didn't happen yet. Yeah, good. But in uh, 35 years of work, I sold instruments. I always sell them, and they always. Uh, I'm always happy to buy my instruments back. And that happened, like, let's say, two or three times. Usually, when I buy them back, I give myself time one year to pay it back, and I try to sell it in this. Uh, one year of period and I, I give them back the money they paid except the consumption tax uh, happened three times and usually after one year if I couldn't sell it I pay them the instrument and I keep the instrument for myself and uh, so I create my own private collection of my instruments from the past and uh, yeah so I believe in my instruments I believe in, in the price increasing of my instruments and it doesn't happen too often, so that probably is, shows me that people are quite happy with what I'm delivering. And uh, well, my I'm... student is very happy. As a cello player and as cello players, um, I believe it's very important in st this entire culture in general. It's uh, we talked about it last time. It's about this relationship with the luthier. It's um, it's not just something you go purchase an item at the store and then you you never go back to that store again. It's important that you maintain a healthy relationship with your luthier. That's why on the channel what I always do, I tell people, find a luthier and really start engaging, going to their shop. And there are luthiers that, that want to make all the money quickly. And then there's luthiers that understand that this will be a relationship that will last for years. Maybe a cheap, maybe a small purchase now, a greater purchase later. And one of my students in, um, in Australia, she says she said she went to the luthier and he did some work as uh, a um, small amount of work but absolutely free she's like it's okay it was just adjusting the bridge putting parchment on the a string yeah. and then um and but she he understands that she has just started in this world of cello and is now getting into a little bit more and maybe she'll return buy some nicer strings which i believe she has and then um and then one day she may i'm pretty sure she would like to uh buy it you know buy an instrument and for the luthier's perspective how how important do you see your role in this in this um what i call the trinity of what makes a cellist we have the music but the pedagogy the repertoire that we we learn and a lot of that has to do with the teacher and then that whole world of learning the music the third the second component is the ensemble because we're performance artists we have to perform you have to perform your music and that's super important as well. So you're on some of the musicians that outlet to create. And the third one that I stress a lot is the luthier. That's why why I'm here with you. That is the reason why I'm here with you is the luthier is more than just a transaction that you purchase an instrument and you leave. It's not just something that you go get strings and work done and leave. Uh, luthier it, is a little bit like your doctor. Mm. Yeah, you can just go to a doctor somewhere where you're on vacation, you go to a doctor and then you get a medicine and that's it. Or you start creating a relation and you rely on the fact that you know the doctor, he knows you because you're a little bit uh, particular. And so he knows all your history and all your uh, things you've got through. And so when you have something, you go there, he looks at you and says, ah, you have this and that, you know? Yeah. Uh, a good luthier knows your instrument and uh, you you just have some uh, minor adjustments you're you're growing you want some more you want more volume you want more response you want this or that and then you walk actually it's not only buying an instrument it's more uh, deciding with whom you want to be next to you who is assisting you with your instrument because your instrument should be part of your body in order to express yourself that's my point of view as a violin maker. If you ever want to take life a little easier, get a puppy. Get I, have a puppy. I, have, I have become a nicer person since getting my puppy, okay? Getting an animal that depends upon you all the time, I've become a nicer teacher. Because like with with the puppy, you have to nicer say- Nicer cello teacher. I've been a, yes. You can pass by and giving her, you know. <laughs> um, and a nicer husband. And a nicer husband, I hope. Um, but I have become a nicer teacher because with the puppy you have to say, very good, very good, I have to give a lot of praise. And with my students I'm very stoic and uh, I only praise them when they deserve it. And, uh, but now I find myself saying, very good, 
like to the smallest things to my students. I'm like, very good. Very good. And because I, speak, <laughs> I teach in French and my, 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 my dog learns in French, we take him to French school, puppy school in France. Um, I, I, I say, très bien, très bien, c'est très bien. Okay, encore une fois, très bien. It's like just way nicer now. <laughs> And I do it with my students in English. That's what I tell you. If you want to just take life a little easier, have an animal. Get a puppy. Get a puppy. <laughs> it's going to like make you a nicer person. Anyway, that's that's the thing. Back to this. So my point is, my point is this. Um, we have a saying in the United States. Um, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. And that means, to those who've never heard that phrase, never heard about that one. Um, you can do what you like to something, but you can doll it up, if you will. Uh -huh. But it's still a pig. A pig's a pig. Lipstick on a pig, doll it up, it's still going to be a pig. There's been a strong, uh, there, there has been a level discussion on the channel and on other channels, and generally online. It's when you get an instrument of a certain quality, I'm talking sub 500, sub 1000, what is the, well, how can you like make it better? Like string wise, component wise. And there's a big question, let's talk about strings and components. So I have a video I talk about. I say, you, buying more expensive strings won't necessarily make your instrument sound better. And I literally have a string that costs me more. It's a soloist edition of the Larson and it doesn't make my cello sound better because it's not balanced. From a luthier's perspective, what Strings do you think about is, that? Strings is the most convenient, easiest things to, to change. They go there, they buy them, they pull them up, and they hear already a difference. Mm. But actually, the instrument has to be adjusted, not by the strings. And then once it is adjusted, then if you have better strings, certainly it sounds better. But uh, a good cello should sound with all kinds of strings quite good. Certainly a sub 500 cello, a euro cello or 500 US dollar cello is already difficult that the strings, a decent string fits in a price like this. But They don't. Yeah. That's why the first thing they do is replace the strings. Yeah, but then the strings are like two, three hundred euro, and then uh, you have actually two expensive strings for the cello you have, and then you realize that the cello is actually not so good. But you cannot turn out now a cello like this to be super sounding. You certainly sure. can maximize its sound. Sure. You can make uh, the curve of the bridge, the thickness of the bridge, the sound post where it stands, yeah. the fingerboard, how it is shaped. Uh, upper nut, uh, pegs who turn, but that does not mean that the sound is now a, a nice warm cello sound which makes you cry if you play a nice romantic piece or something. Uh, it would be just... Uh, you have to understand, some people, they don't like, in some parts of the world, like in South America and different places, getting the, the level of money it takes to get into this, this world is very difficult. It's a big barrier to cross. So for someone who has spent five hundred dollars, and it's they've some of them have saved up for months for that point, yeah. and they get that instrument, and maybe they put some nice strings on it, they will cry every time they play it because they didn't have anything like that before. But good musicians can play on every kind of instrument, sure. and they can be able to transmit a certain emotion yeah. on even on a cello which costs only one hundred. You know, so it's. Uh, we are here talking about a certain luxury. Yeah, it's like driving a car, and then you go with a Mercedes B, and uh, you are complaining or or S class or whatever. It's downsizing is always difficult, uh, but we actually we are all here very spoiled and. But certainly, it, if you can, but I think we're, I think yeah, we're also more blessed. blessed. You, if you can afford it, you know why not? I think you know, we're it's, it's also nice to 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 uh, uh, put some uh, effort in something you love, and it makes happiness. You know, there are some people in in the world that, for them to afford even five hundred American dollars for an instrument, is one of the largest investments they've ever made in their life, and for that person to then play that the cello for as many years as they can. You know, you said the strings are the easy thing to replace because even though they may, they may cost two, three hundred euro, 
they still increase the quality mm -hmm. and the playability. Yeah. I always talk about the, the fingerboard, adjust the bridge. How much of the tailpiece is going to, um, would you consider? I would only take a European uh, tailpiece, so like then it doesn't make a Vitna or a Acousticus or something. And, and they're like 25, uh, 30 euro, maybe even 20. But I wouldn't save on, on, on that one and taking a, a lousy one for five euro. Uh, and I think it sounds better and you have less problems. Yeah. One of my students in, um, in California, she started on a cello that she got offline off Amazon and she she took lessons with me via Skype, which is um, Hello Wanju if you're watching. And she fell in love with the cello, so much so that she visited my luthier in San Jose and came back with two cellos. Two and cellos. She, 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 she bought a German-made cello, a Deutsche. Um, and she spent well, I can say 10 times as much on, on it. She went from a very small investment not knowing because a lot of people that get into this this world, they didn't go to conservatoire. They didn't like grow up with music. They just like a lot of people who watch this video right now love cello just because they love the sound of it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they watch my videos, they watch other people on YouTube, and they're inspired by this wonderful, very personal world that that the string music is. And they want to be part of that. And then they look at the prices and they're like, Wow. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> and so they start by a small purchase. And then some of them get bitten by the bug and they, they go and they can make the leap into a larger instrument. Like my student. My student was renting a trade cello from, actually I reviewed it on this channel, from Toulouse and decided, after two years of renting this cello, decided, I want a cello that sounds like yours, he said. Not so much mine, he said. But he said, I'm playing everything in tune. For those of you watching, sometimes you're playing everything in tune, everything's right. But you get to a point, and he's playing um, Sound of Silence, and he's playing it, and his, his intonation's good, his bow technique is good, everything is good, the strings are good too. And he says, Why doesn't it sound like yours? It's okay, because it's an Edgar. No, I, I don't say that, but I do say, it is the quality of your instrument. You need a better, there's gets to a point as a cello player that you need to make that leap if you want it to sound better, nicer, fuller, deeper, more, ev more of everything. And so I got in contact with Edgar, with you, and, uh, and well, now he has your cello, and the moment he placed it on his sternum and he played the C and the G, it just, it filled. But you have to, as a musician, you have to be, you have to give yourself the time to arrive at that point that you are able to create and get out this. And so it took them two years. Some people are changing already too early and they're not at that point. So I would always say, calm down a little bit, let it pass a little bit, this desire of changing and go through and continue playing. And meanwhile, you search already and try different instruments and see the price and everything. Uh, it's, it, there is a reason that for every kind of level of a mus musician, there is a certain kind of level of cello or instrument out there. Yeah? And if you get now, let's say, a Stradivari or a real Montagnana from the 17th century, you wouldn't be able to make it sound as, as much as it could sound. So you have to qualify for every kind of level on the instrument. Does a Stradivarius today sound better than it was first created? Let's say the golden era of Stradivari. So this is a question, uh, I, actually I, nobody is able to answer. But just, uh, what is the because consensus the instruments in this at that time, uh, the, the people don't talk about this actually. Yeah. Stradivari cellos has never been so uh, super, uh, the prices are very high because he, he made a few, only a few cellos. He made all his cellos only in two years. Uh, so there are not so many cellos as violins and he made them all baroque so with a smaller bass bar a different neck different strings a different bridge uh, so so repeat that 
wind solo, Stradivarius cellos. Was not made how they are set up now. They were okay. not made no, like there. No, so all, all Stradivarius no cellos. No neck was inserted into the body, but was nailed onto the ribs with a barrack neck, a larger neck, a shorter fingerboard, gut strings, the A much lower. Every single Stradivarius cello every, was Every Bahok. cello, every violin, all instruments completely different. No instrument has never been made by Stradivari with an ebony fingerboard, uh, with a neck long of, for a violin, 13 centimeters from the cello, 28. They were all smaller, lower, all baroque. Baroque and modern made instruments are completely two different issues, okay? So his idea of sound was completely something different. It's like making, turning out of a classical guitar, electric guitar. That more or less, it's okay. the, the difference. Okay, I didn't know that. Yes, and he made them classic and we turned them to, to be like electric in order to, f to fill up all the big halls. More and more people wanted to listen to the music. At that time of Stradivari, it was not important that it's loud, how it is right now. Okay. And in Asia, they want it all screaming and they think that the louder it is, the better it is. It's not true. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I learned something new. Yeah. Yes, it's a, it's a mood, no? Right? It's, it's a you, sordino. A sordino. sordino. You put it on the bridge. Put it on the bridge. And it blocks actually the movement of the bridge. Yes in order that it doesn't sound too loud. So yes. now if you want to play at home and your neighbor is knocking already and screaming, yes. Basta! Basta! <laughs> basta! Basta! Ah, basta! <laughs> ah, voglio dormire! <laughs> I want to sleep! Yeah, then, then you put this on and then it's like, like putting something like this on your lip or on your tongue. You wouldn't be able to talk anymore. This is the heavier it is. This one is pretty heavy. The less you hear your cello. So the question is, and this was a, actually a question that was brought up by a viewer in Toulouse, of all places, of my own town. Um, do, have you ever heard, has any luthier here in Cremona ever heard of a mute, an Artino mute or any mute, damaging the instrument, particularly the, the bass bar? No. By, by virtue of the fact that because it vibrates less, and it doesn't vibrate enough, the bass bar inside falls off. Oh my God, it's like a disaster scenario, huh? No, it's impossible. So, so just want to make it super clear. Some people think that these are dangerous for your instrument. Dangerous. These even. are dangerous. These, these. Uh, what is your consent? Because I know that when you apply well, to I, the, the cello, let me finish, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know that when you apply these to the instrument, you need to like be careful with yes. it. Pinch it like this, don't like push it down. Yet from your professional perspective, mutes uh, like this is a half metal, half rubber. Yeah. What is your consensus? What is your opinion? I saw these ones also made out of wood and look also nice. But the bridge is made out of wood. And if you would have an idea how much I'm thinking about how to make a bridge, how the bridge up there, 2.4 millimeters and a certain edge and how the string has to lie on the bridge and everything. And then I see people scratching this on and, 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 and the bridge is just damaged by how this is pushed on. It really hurts me. And even here, it's, <laughs> I see it a little bit sharp here, even so it's rubber. Um, I know I put I, this I on don't your cello. Really, I don't really love it to put it on, but if you are quite a little bit delicate and you put it on, no problem. It's just that if you put it every day on, certainly then the bridge gets some signs. In this case, some black rubber signs. Yes, but right? besides cosmetic, it's, it would have caused significant damage to the inside of the cello to the, you know, the bass bar to if, the if sound you, If you are mechanics and you have black hair, uh, black hands because of the oil you are working on, on oily, greasy thing, doesn't make you now a nasty person, right? Okay. A little bit the same thing. So Shouldn't... be just cosmetic, really. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's really that's really the question because that was just... an issue. These are safe. They're great. But like I said on the channel, and like Edgar saying. The practice mute is intended for only, only occasional use, not all the time. Be aware of that. Just put it on if you have to do it late at night. Otherwise, it's much better to allow the instrument to sing 
can't really do what it needs to do. What are you holding? This is a sound post setter. How the name says already, here it's a little bit sharpened. Every luthier is making his own kind of edge here. You have the sound post, you squeeze it a little bit inside, then you actually put a little bit of water or saliva on it. <laughs> then you put it on. You don't want to cut the sound post with this one. Uh, I have here like a sound post. This is now a straw here, but you put it a little bit like this, okay? And then you have the sound post, the F hole, you go in and go like this and then tick, tick, and here's the top here now. And then tack, 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 and then you have the sound post standing straight. And then with this end, you can go inside and, and move it a little bit on one side and the other one, yeah? So some people then use even a hammer to, to move the, the sound post. I think with this one is heavy enough and no need to hammer here with a specific other tool. So actually this for cello I do everything with this one, yeah? Except if I want to move the sound post a little bit more inside, I don't use this one but then I use, I put the cello on the ribs and then I go through the F holes and I put a ruler inside and make tick tick just a little bit and I move the inside. Except all the other movements I do with this one up, down, out, even the lower end inside I use like this, I, I, I squeeze a little bit and the sound post is moving, yeah, like this, if I have like this. So yeah. I have a story about this tool. Um, I have a student in Toulouse and she has that famous black cello a lot of you have seen on the channel. And she went to a luthier and this is a story for all of you that have, are new to this world. She went to Luthier and she came back with a, with a, with a write-up for different work to be done. And the Luthier wanted to charge her 160 euro to adjust the sound post. She said the sound post wasn't correctly placed where it needs to be, which is below the left, I guess, what, if you're uh -huh. looking down, if you're looking down at your cello, it's, it's below that left leg if of, the, of, the, of, the, of your bridge, of your chevalet. So it was 160 euro. I saw that order and it says, mm, that's too much. Because in my experience, I know that's not necessarily so. I asked her to go to a different luthier, which she had the luxury of doing here in, uh, there in Toulouse, which saw her sand post, took this tool out, just as you just did, tick, 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 tick. It was free. From 160 euro to zero euro, which then, you know, I understand that sometimes luthiers need to make their money, but I'm going to just as a public service announcement, if you're walking into a luthier, and I've noticed this happen with other students of mine, they walk in there and you don't have an instrument of their quality, a lot of luthiers think that I'm going to have to make as much money as I can right now on this student, on this player, because they clearly don't know our world. They're coming in with an instrument that isn't of the quality. I'm pretty sure you don't do that, but I'm, there are a lot of people. Uh, I don't do it, but among, on the among, other my side, students I have to a little that. bit also uh, tell you a little bit a different point of view of the whole situation. Uh, if I listen to your story, I certainly, probably it was a student, cheap instrument, everything. Yes. I think yes. then it's overpriced, and probably I also would do it immediately. It comes in, I, I do it also most of the times free. On the other side, let's say. Yesterday my customer, um, he arrived, he even owns my violin and he arrived with my violin and wanted to get everything uh, set up again how it should be. I listened to the sound, it, I could tell it has been played for two years and it responded like an antique instrument. And on the other side then I started to measure and to see and then I discovered many, many small details which have been changed. And while I was doing and working in it, I was just saying, okay, Edgar here, hours and hours go in, he's first violinist. If I would now charge actually my cost of the time I dedicated for him, I have to charge five, six, seven hundred euros. Otherwise, I could not make my living with my workshop. But then and again, everything. you are personally doing this work yourself. Yes, of course. There yeah. you go. Otherwise, it's not. 
I cannot uh, survive otherwise. And it goes hours and hours. And at the end of the day, he went out and he was happy. So it's always a question. If you go in and you just want quick something, I, quick, I can do everything. If somebody stops by here, I can also adjust if it's something is. But if you are now first violinist and you have some tiny things which you want to, to we are here talking about a, a level of Formula One, okay? You want the fine adjustment, then it's becoming very expensive. And actually, material cost is zero. It's just time, experience, and you have to know exactly what you do. And you cannot make any mistake. The musician wants to get exactly what he's asking for, and that has a certain price. Yeah? You know, when I grew up, the idea of having a cello arrive at your door it's just, was, just fantastic. And you it know, just it it happened just like last so week, a couple weeks people. ago. It came from here to Toulouse. It's incredible. And the idea of just like going click, 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 even on your phone, la di da, and it's, <laughs> la di da, <laughs> and, it's, and it's at your door. Yeah, it's, just, it's amazing. It's, it's, nice. it's amazing, and I think so. From my perspective, very much so, it is the future. Ordering online, being able to work online. Tell me about the luthiers. And for all of you who are watching who have Amazon bought cellos, tell me about those luthiers who do. What do you think of that? What do you guys think of that? Colleagues of mine tell me that if they see that I, let's say, I'm, I'm also uh, selling my instruments via Toman, is a very big uh, retailer, online in shop in Europe. Uh, I think it's just fantastic. And when I, I got to know it, I just thought, hey, I, they have to sell my instruments. But how about the other people? What are the, how about the other luthiers that aren't you, they Mr. YouTube Man? They tell these stories of how they treat them, how they throw these people out of their workshop. Here, in Cremona, this is worldwide. Even in, here in Cremona, worldwide. They, but here in Cremona, there are more violin makers I talk to. So they tell me that they just are how, how much they charge and how they don't do... So don't, they take them for they, everything. They, they don't even touch the instrument, you know? They just throw them out because they buy so crap. Don't you think crap. that's given a bad name to our culture? If I'm into something, I don't know, let's say it's something completely different, the first thing is I go on the internet, I look in, and uh, let's say, Amazon, what they have, and if there is something and I like it, I buy it, because in that very moment I want to, to have it, and, and there's nothing bad about it, you know? But, but why are they treated like second-class citizens by Luthiers when they want to be part of this world? Because that drives uh, me crazy. Here in Cremona, certainly we are in the, in the high level of violin making True. and, and uh, people uh, want to, to work only on nice uh, handmade instruments. But I think it all starts, everybody in the beginning has been a, a beginner at one point. So. I think it's good that you give them a little bit of attention and you make them understand what is the difference and why it is so expensive to do this or that and you have to you can explain people people are human and you can explain you know so I even yesterday to my musicians I had to explain him exactly every single step what I'm doing and once the people understand then they understand what how much time goes actually into one tiny bridge sound post Fingerboard, neck, upper nut, pegs, every piece of the instrument can be made in a way that they go hours and hours and all these very time consuming steps make a great sounding instrument. So it's, uh, it's only a question of time. How much are you willing to pay the time of a violin maker? But um, it all starts... Unless you agree it's not right. It all starts somewhere. Yeah, certainly. And for a lot of us, a lot of us are returning cellists. I was once, some of you don't know, I was once a returning cellist. I was once that guy that bought that instrument online for $600. That was me. <laughs> really? Because I had a different life and I had an incredible German-made cello. I went to university, won competition, la di da. <laughs> la di da. <laughs> and life changed. And I left cello for a brief moment in my life and I came back knowing that I had already gotten to a level of playing hiding concertos, winning a nationwide competition. I was already at that level, but this wasn't at that level at that time. But my passion, my love for music was high. What did I do? I bought a cello for less than $600. 
and of course slapped some yargers on it, put a vintner uh, tailpiece on it, went to, and when I brought that cello, that $600 berry, the laminate, I guess they call it the laminate cello, the laminate cello to my luthier in San Jose, he didn't bat an eye, he didn't judge me, he took it, he adjusted it, he took this little thing out, ding, 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 for free, put some strings on it, it was lovely. Later on, I got a nice Romanian cello from him. Later on, I got the Rus. You see, because a lot of us have already gotten to that level. But like I said, we have a lot of returning cellists, people that have played to a high level in their youth, left because life changes, kids happen. 20 years later, 30 years later, they have the time, they have the energy, the passion is still there. They come back to cello, but the, again, the barrier to entry to our world is this incredible amount of money we have to in, in back, put back into it. For somebody that is in maybe in their 40s, 50s, or 60s that wants to get back into this, that $500 instrument is a huge deal to them. And these people can already play Bach. These people can already play in, in um, you know, Beethoven symphonies. Sure, they don't have the nice gear that they had at that time, but they can still do it. And just it just drives me crazy. And it's just something I'm really, really against. And if you're a luthier, luthier out there that does this, don't ever come knocking on my door coming on this channel. Or if you know a luthier that does that, don't ever go there to again. <laughs> I, I, that is something, I don't use the word hate very much, yeah. but hate is something that's weighted in emotion. And that is something that is just, I'm so against. I believe that cello, this music world, is an incredible experience to be part of. We're blessed to be part of it. You as a maker, me as a player. We are both as creators online. And I think it's a wonderful thing to be sharing this passion, not only with each other live, but also online. And as Amazon being an avenue, it's why should we judge those that get those instruments? And that's just, I'm sorry, that's a tangent. That's just where I'm standing on that. And I'm glad that you, at least you treat those people nicely. And for all those lutees no, out there. Generally speaking, I think I just treat people how I want to be treated and then the other way around. So, uh, yeah. Uh, let's talk about the future. Let's talk about China. China, I'm sorry if you don't agree. China is the future. China is the future to me in so many different ways. China is today, China is tomorrow. In the way that, and I am very appreciative of what China does when it comes to the amount of work. And I'm saying it from outside perspective, I want to get your definite inside perspective because you've been there. But for me as somebody that appreciates everything about our culture and understanding that these Amazon cellos come from factories in China, these trade cellos come from factories in China that are, you know, that, that I know that my Luthi in San Jose would say, you know, he has trained those men and women to work as hard as they can, get paid a penance as what they would pay in the States, and they still make great instruments. And they still share the passion of violin making, not at the, the level of here as so much as your education, but the passion is still all the same, especially for those who make instruments for his shop. Because to get that certain level, they still love the instrument. A lot of their families play cello, a lot of their fam uh, children play violin, because they're around it, which is a great thing. I still think that, from my Western perspective, there isn't enough appreciation of what China does for our culture. What is your opinion about that? What is your experience of that? Uh, I, I, I really don't know if, if I'm uh, up to... Because uh, you've been to Beijing. About, yes, I, I'm going there. But and you told because me. Because Chinese China are, is the future. I can read what we yeah, chat but, but the, the, the <laughs> China is... Uh, is a good customer because they, they certainly want our instruments. Yes. Uh, they want our instruments, the most expensive ones, and not the Chinese instruments. And China is the producer of, of very uh, economic instruments, making a lot of shop instruments for, in America, very uh, used that the people in, in the violin makers have uh, Chinese instruments in their shop. And they talk very good about those instruments. Jay Hyde. Have you heard of that brand? Yes, of course. The Jay Hyde is made in Guangzhou. Yeah, it's but, made but in China. I have to... From Ishan Violins in Berkeley, he California. Is very, <laughs> he loves this. The, the reality is that there's so much more profit on Chinese-made instruments. Of course. 
Yeah, because of they course. buy, they sell a, a container of instruments, and of then they can pay the instruments within three years, and they can sell it for ten times as much more money. I'm so a capitalist just as much as you, and a man gotta make his money. <laughs> and like, if and he's if he's making violins or cellos. Gotta let a man make his money, or a lady make his mo or her money. I, I cannot, I cannot make the same uh, profit on an instrument which comes from my workshops. So when you go to Beijing, what do you feel that is yeah, there? I see a lot of, of, of uh, companies selling very uh, economic instruments. Yeah. I just think it's good that these instruments are out there because many people have the opportunity to 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 get started. But this is just the start, and out of let's say 100,000, maybe 500 qualify for a handmade instrument and out of these 500 maybe 50 qualify for an Italian instrument handmade yeah. uh, and that's actually where I'm getting into the, the business so uh, these big quantities of economic instruments I, I actually I, I don't have too much experience about. Would you as an as a, as a Italian luthier want to be more downstream when it comes to something like that. Do you see something in the future like you For linking Cremona, up? I'm, I'm already doing a lot that I have something more affordable ones with these German instruments, but I'm, I'm looking exactly where it is made and I go there in Germany and I pick out my instruments so that I'm sure that they're made there. So I, because my customers are actually Chinese and they buy these instruments and they don't want to buy something which is made in China. They have it themselves, they recognize it immediately. So uh, there, there wouldn't be any sense. So I'm, I'm even a small fine tuner, I don't want that it is made in China. I want it German, Italian, European, yeah. My cello is made in Italy, then uh, great, that's, that's going to be, it already has an inherent Oh, that was a bird. Um, this brings a lot of luck. <laughs> I'm glad you think so, dude. I just can't do that. When you say some a cello, my cello is made in country. It doesn't matter the maker. Before you even know where it is made, I believe that there, in my experience as well, there is an inherent value of just being from that country. Yes and no. You just have to imagine a. People say, ah, Cremona, it's just enough that you put Cremona in and then it's expensive. Just, I think that competition, for instance, in Cremona is so high that if there is Cremona inside, the ones who made it are under such a big pressure of because there are so many people in such a small uh, town and they make their living that you would actually, if you want to survive in making, it's not enough to come to Cremona. It would be actually easier to go to a different city. Okay. There are so many makers that it's not easy to make a living here in Cremona. So for all those who believe that just Italy or just Cremona inside is, is, a, is, is, is a runner and is selling like a, a warm panino, uh, it's a completely different issue. Yeah? You see it from the point of view of jealous makers who are not in Cremona. I just would wish to those makers to come here and to try to make a living and then they realize what it actually means and what it takes to be a violin maker in Cremona because it's not this easy. True. So what I'm hearing is just if you were to get an instrument made here, it already shows that, that you, you have a certain quality. Yes. And even if Ludovico, he was now here, the waiter of the bar here, and he was my student, and he just told me that he won silver medal in a certain competition, is a now, waiter yeah. here that shows you already how <laughs> difficult it is, first, make a violin, second, to make silver medal, and then third, make a living of making violins. So even if he's good making good instruments, he cannot make a living. So. It takes a lot to make a living here in Cremona, in the mecca of violin making in of the world. Yeah. yeah. And so second in place, I think, I think it's a tie between France and Germany. Yeah. Um, like if you have a cello made in France or Germany, but I think there's more makers in Germany. I just think there is. In my experience, I've not seen many cellos of like, of like no, sub ten thousand made in France. It's just they're not often. They exist, but not as much as Germans. There's much more German ones. Right I've seen. now, made new ones in Germany. Right now, probably yeah, more. This made made yeah. modern instruments but today. In the, in the past, yeah, yeah. Modern, so I would yeah. say, like you know, because of its rarity, maybe French would be second place just because. 
Um, but then again, I wouldn't know. So I'd support German and France a second. Third, third is interesting. I say um, the U.S. The U.S. Uh, would be third because there are some makers in the U.S. that make good instruments. Yeah. Um, they can't because they're just because it's American made. They can't really. If you said, if I just said to you, I have a German cello, I have a Italian cello, and I have an American cello. In your mind, you have three steps. You're going to put Italy at the top. You're going to put German in the middle and American below. You're just going to. It's just a psychological re... Uh, for me, it's a psychological ranking we have. In China, we're going to put below American. Japanese, we're going to maybe put it... I'm not so... I'm not so... Yeah. No, so I, think, I, I think Americans are actually... Uh, right now, there is a big gap between America and Europe. And Americans do their own things. And uh, we are a little bit... What do you mean by that? There's a big uh, gap between the United States and, and Europe. I, I don't know why we, we don't sell more in the United States right now. But uh, in America, Master Mage uh, Violin, let's say, uh, is starting at, yeah, to be considered by a professional musician, 40,000. Yeah. Otherwise, they don't even look at it. Uh, yeah, here in Europe, would say 20,000 up, and then they, they consider it already. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit different here between Europe and America. And the Americans have a very high level because the makers in America had a more uh, a different culture of facing certain problems, of learning everybody from each other, uh, organizing certain workshops uh, regarding uh, sound adjustment, regarding varnishing. Yeah. Uh, they face the whole thing different, a little bit more open. I actually I admire the, the American way uh, in, in learning and from each other and collaborating. And, and we are a little bit, uh, from this point of view, a little bit yeah, different and a little bit more, yeah, 